as we teach this series, our goal is to help us to be fully established in the truth, mm -hmm. in the truth of the grace of God, to be fully established in it. God desires us for, to, for us to enjoy fellowship and relationship with him that's grounded in his love. This can only be experienced continually when we understand, believe in, and trust in his grace. The moment we begin to focus on, depend on, and rely upon our own good works, we give Satan the ability to condemn us. Mm -hmm. That's why many of us, we live in a state of constant condemnation. We're feeling bad about ourselves, and so we assume that God feels the same way about us because Satan is constantly going to push you back into performance, push you back into behavior. and. Knowing full well that you're going to flaw, you have flaws and that you're going to fail, you're going to fall short. But that's why Jesus said in John chapter uh, 8, uh, verse 31, he says, verse 31 and 32, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Mm -hmm. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we assume that just because the truth exists, that we're free. No, he didn't say that. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So only the truth that you know will make you free. Only the truth that you know. That's why we're constantly teaching them. That's why this is a series. Because if I just delivered this in one message, you'd never get it. You wouldn't retain it. Mm -hmm. So you have to hear this repeated, repeatedly. You have to hear it over and over again for it to really settle in your mind and your heart. And it's something that uh, is so richly taught in the scriptures that uh, many times we pass over it. We gloss over it. We don't remember it. So I want you to really be established in the grace of God, established in, in your relationship with God. That last song Jonathan played about, uh, about grace, no matter what I've done, no matter where I've been, no matter how I fall, you lift me up again. That is the biblical truth. Now, for most of us, we don't like that because we've, we've heard about our performance our whole lives. Mm -hmm. We've heard about our performance, and we believe because we're saved and we've been saved for a minute, you know, that we've been living right. And so God likes us better the way we are now. He likes us better because we've been performing. My friend, that's not true. So let's dive into this this morning, but let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your loving kindness, tender mercy. Thank you for your grace which abounds toward us, Father God. Your word says, for where sin abounded. Grace does much more abound. So we thank you, Lord God, for how you've established us in your grace. Thank you for your love that you have for us. I pray, Father God, for full understanding yes. by faith of these truths as we proclaim them. I thank you that you, by your spirit, will speak to your people, speak to their hearts and their minds so that they can understand what you desire that they hear. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 One of the things that uh, the Apostle Paul spent so much time in the books of Romans and Galatians and Colossians really combating this ideology that you have to perform to be acceptable to God. We don't really understand the degree that, that he went to, nor what the, the real problem is when we do that. So I'm going to try to dive into that this morning. Help us to really understand why it's so important that we live in the grace of God and not live by works, because we don't really understand what it says to God when we live by works. We really don't understand that. I'm going to try to help us understand that this morning, so bear with me. Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 19, it says, what the law says is for those who are under the law. It stops anyone from making excuses, and it brings the whole world under God's judgment. That's what the law did. Because no one can be right, made right with God by following the law. The law only shows us our sin. But God has a way to make people right, and it has nothing to do with the law. He has now shown us that new way which the law and the prophets told us about. God makes people right through their faith in Jesus Christ. Let's repeat that. God makes people right through their faith in Jesus Christ. He does this for all who believe in Christ. Everyone is the same. All have sinned and are not good enough to share God's divine greatness. They are made right with God by his grace. This 
is a free gift. They're made right with God by being made free from sin through Jesus Christ. God gave Jesus as a way to forgive people's sins through their faith in him. God can forgive them because the blood sacrifice of Jesus pays for their sin. God gave Jesus to show that he always does what is right and fair. So this passage directs us to understand that the law spoke to those who were under it and declared everyone on earth guilty before God. You have to understand that. So everybody that you ever run into is guilty before God. The saved and the unsaved are guilty before God. Okay. The law did not provide a, a, a path, a way, or a means to be right with God. It, is, it was not a road map to righteousness. Understand that's what the law was not. It was not a road map to righteousness. It unveils, reveals, and shows us our sinfulness. It does not show us how to be right, but it shows us what we are doing wrong. It is like an indictment of crimes that we have committed. You ever know, you see someone, they've been indicted, and it shows all of the things that the or prosecutors are saying that they did. But one of the things you'll notice, it doesn't tell them how to be right. It just tells you what you did wrong. Well, that's what the law did. It told you what you were doing wrong. Okay? Uh, God has made a way for us to be right with him that is separate from the law, that doesn't include the law. Romans chapter 8, it's not on the screen, but Romans chapter 8 says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So there was nothing wrong with the law. The problem was our inability to keep it. It was weak through the flesh. So what was wrong with the law was me. What was wrong with the law was you because we couldn't keep it. We could not keep it. So that was the problem with the law. It's nothing wrong with it. It's wrong, something wrong with us. So uh, God, is, it is where God makes us right with him by believing in Jesus, and he does it for everyone who believes in Jesus. It's the exact same for everyone because we have all sinned and come short of God's glory. So it's really funny how we think in our minds that there are some people who, when they get saved, well, God's got to do some special work with them. I mean, you know, we, when we came to Christ, because we didn't do as much as they did, you know, those certain categories, well, that's sin. God has to do something extra. For us, he just let us believe in Jesus, but they got to believe in Jesus and they got to do all of these other things. Well, that's not what the Bible says. He says it's the same for everyone who believes in Jesus. That does not mean that everybody doesn't need to repent after they believed in Jesus and everybody doesn't need to change their behavior. You do. But the justification on being made righteous takes place without you making one change whatsoever. It's something that God does. Our, so, uh, all and his grace is freely given unto us as a gift. Everybody say gift. It is not something that any of us has earned or that we in any way deserve. Yeah. Our sins are completely forgiven us unto us by the blood that Jesus shed for us. He shed his blood for you and for me. We all sing the songs. We all know the story. But do you really believe that all of your sins are forgiven because of Jesus' blood? They're not forgiven because of your blood, your effort, your energy, your sweat, your, your toil. They're forgiving you not because of how well you've done in the past week. That's what we think. We evaluate ourselves in the past week, and I've done pretty good, God. <laughs> I've done pretty good. I didn't cuss nobody out this week. You know, I, 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 I let the lady have the parking space in the, in the, in the grocery store parking lot, even though I was there before her. I even took my, my shopping cart and put it back in the thing. I didn't just leave it by the curb or leave it in the parking space. No, I wouldn't put it back. God, I'm righteous, right? No. <laughs> You're righteous even if you don't put the cart back. Yeah. You're righteous even if you yeah. don't do the right thing because you're righteous by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. You see, grace was orchestrated by God without any input from anybody. Mm -hmm. No human being gave him input. It was not a response to somebody's prayer. Grace is God's divine provision for us to make us right with him, and he gave it to us as a gratuitous gift. 
It was given to you as a gift. You didn't earn it. Since you didn't earn it, you can't do anything to lose it because it was given as a gift. You didn't buy it. You know, we, we, when we think of, uh, of something that we own or something that's ours, realistically in, this, in, the, in the world we live in, there are certain things that you really never own. You say, well, I own my home. No, you don't. <laughs> say, well, 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 well I, I burned my mortgage. Yeah, you did. You got property taxes. I dare you. As a matter of fact, I double dog dare you. Don't pay your property taxes for about five years. <laughs> You don't get a, it's the uh, county sheriff, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, you got to go. Mm -hmm. The county is seizing this house. But wait a minute, I got the mortgage payment said paid in full. It doesn't matter. They, you never really own it. You don't. That's just the truth. So we kind of in our minds think that our salvation works that way. It's never really secure. I, I still got to perform. I still got to measure up. I still got to do the best I can. And life causes fluctuations. I woke up this morning, just didn't feel spiritual. I didn't feel very deep. I didn't feel very holy. I didn't feel very righteous. I just woke up just like, I don't know why. I just woke up like that. But did anything change with God? No. My feelings have nothing to do with how God feels about me. My thoughts have nothing to do with how God thinks about me. No. We believe that God feels the way about you the way you feel about you. We feel that God thinks about us the way we think about us. We measure ourselves by our performance on a daily basis and we presume that God does the same. You know, well, next week, one of the things I'm really going to really try to show you is that we, you have to be focused on the Word of God. That's why the John 8, 32 is so important. You've got to know the truth because the truth never changes. It never changes. So you say, well, how does God feel about me? All you got to do is pick up your Bible and open it. Yeah. What he said, he still says. What he meant, he still means. How he feel, said he feels is how he, say, he, he feels. The Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He did what he did for you because he loved you. And it says uh, in uh, Romans chapter 5, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait till you straightened it out. He didn't wait till you got it right. He didn't wait till you behaved good enough. Well, I think she did good enough this week. I think I'm going to die for her. No, he would have never died for any of us. Amen. Amen. If he was waiting on us to get it right, he would have never died for any of us. But he died for us because of his love for us. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. It says, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. So I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is so important here. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no pur purpose. The King James Version said he died in vain. The Christian life we now live should be by faith in Jesus, the Son of God. That's it. Faith in what he has done for us, not what we have to do for him or what we have done for him, but what he has done for us. Our trust for everything when it comes to God should be in him who loved us and gave himself for us. It's one thing for someone to say they love you, but it's another thing entirely to, 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 for them to give themselves for you. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he should lay his life down for his friends. He called us friends, even though we weren't good friends to him. If someone, if you have a friend who treated you the way we treated Jesus, you wouldn't call him a friend. No, but he called us friends. Friends, he laid down his life for us when we didn't deserve it. Paul in this passage declares that, that if righteousness or right standing with God can be obtained by performing the law or by our behavior, then we nullify, frustrate, or inhibit the grace of God. 
To be to frustrate, you know, to be frustrated is you're attempting to do something and it just won't cooperate. You're attempting to get something done and it just won't go and line up. It won't, you know, people playing golf, if you're trying to knock that little ball into that little hole and it just keeps veering off to the left or veering off to the right or it goes straight when you need to curve a little bit, that's frustrating. Mm -hmm. Well, we get frustrated when we're attempting to do something and, and it's, we're being inhibited from doing it. God's grace has an objective. When we, when we try to be perform and we try to live up to the standard on our own, yeah. the objective of God's grace is not achieved. We nullify the grace of God. That's what we do. If being right with God is in any way the result of our works of performing the law, then the purpose for us of Christ's death does not benefit us at all. His death was in vain. It serves no purpose. God intended for his grace alone to be the means for salvation, righteousness, and earthly blessing and eternal life for us without any works upon our, on us at all. If it possibly can be obtained by works or performance, it is to imply that Jesus' suffering and death was not necessary. Wow that there was another way for a person to be made right with God. Think of what God did. He sent his only begotten son into this earth, had him to be born of a virgin, have him to be born as a baby, have him have to grow up dealing with humanity, being a, being a human being, and then have him as a human being to be beaten, to suffer, and to die for us. That's the physical part. Mm -hmm. The other part is the spiritual part with all of our sins, the sins of the whole world for all time on him. Yeah. To be turned away by God, to be rejected by God. He went through all of that. And for us to say that we can be made right with God through somehow through our performance mm -hmm. is to say that all of that was unnecessary. You didn't need to do that just by saying, God, I got this. Wow. That's what we're saying. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 26. We're going to look at a couple of verses in Matthew chapter 26. I want to really try to just hone in on this a little bit. So this is Jesus. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a few hours before he's crucified. And he's there praying. And these are, these are the words he says. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He's saying to his father, is there another way for us to do this? Do I have to go through this? Do I have to suffer this way? If it's possible that this world can be redeemed in every human being, and if it's consistent with satisfying eternal justice that their sins would be paid for, that punishment would be meted out for them, and with maintaining your righteous government of the universe, if it's possible for people to be saved without me going through all this pain, all this agony, all this separation, all this sorrow, with me bearing the weight of of all the punishment for all the sins of the world on me, let's go that direction. Let's do that. That's what he's saying. You've got to understand, this is God the Son. God's Son, who, his beloved Son, who has been with him throughout eternity. And he's saying, let's find another way if it's possible. That's his humanity crying out. Yeah. Let's find another way to do this. Then in verse 42 of the same chapter, it says, again for the second time he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Think about it. The fact that these sufferings, the punishment, the judgments and agony were not removed from him and that Jesus had to go forward and bear them without relief shows that it was not consistent with the justice of God or the welfare of the universe that people could be saved without him suffering those awful sufferings he did for us. It wasn't possible. There was no other way. Say that with me. There was, there was no, other way. no other way. No other way. No other way. But he willingly did it. There's a place in, in the Gospels where Peter, uh, when they finally come to capture Jesus, so Peter cuts off the ear of a man who's trying to grab Jesus with his sword. And Jesus said, put away your sword. He said, don't you know 
I could but call upon my Father, and he shall presently give me 12 legions of angels. A legion of, a legion, a Roman legion was 6,000 to 12,000 soldiers. He's saying, I can call on my Father, and he will give me 72,000 angels right now. They would have destroyed the world. They would have wiped it out. But he said, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? How will I save the world if I don't go through this? He willingly went through it because it was the only way. There was no other way for this to be accomplished. So if it's possible for you to be made right with God through your performance, if it's possible for you to be made right with God through any other means through the, except the death and burial of Jesus Christ, my friends, you're saved that Jesus went through what he went through yeah. for no reason. Come on. Come on. That's how strong this is. You're saying his death was in vain. You're saying his death served no purpose. What an insult. Yeah. What an insult to him. Yeah. Having paid what he paid in the way he paid it. Yeah. The Bible says his visage or his appearance was marred more than any man. He was almost unrecognizable because of what they did to his flesh with the beating that they gave him with that cat of nine tails. It was almost unrecognizable. He shed his blood suffering agony for you and me. And for us to say, God, I can be right with you through my performance is to say Jesus didn't have to go through that. No, my friends, we don't ever want to say that. We don't ever want that to be a thought. That's why it's imperative that we trust entirely in him and recognize fully that it was only through him and his, the blood of his cross that I'm right with God. And since I'm right with God through the blood of his cross and he's not going to undo what he did, my righteousness cannot be undone. My standing with God cannot be undone. It's permanent. I'm right with God through faith in what Jesus did and not through faith in what I did or what I do. Amen. That's what we have to understand. We've got to understand, we, I will never say his death had no purpose. I will never say he died in vain. Yeah. So I will spend my life totally, yeah. completely trusting yeah. in him. Yeah. We've got to we've got to take that like that. Yeah. We've got to see the agony he went through. To say that what you did is unnecessary, yeah. to say I could be right with God without you, Jesus? Oh no. No way. We've got to understand that. So look at look at Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Paul says, stand fast in the liberty with which Christ has made us free and do not again be held with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you are circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do all the law. You who are justified by law are deprived of all effect from Christ. You fell from grace. Usually when we think of somebody falling from grace, we think of somebody who is, uh, you know, they were Christian, they were living for God, they were moving along, and then they fell into some type of sin. They got into some type of trouble, and so then they fell from grace. No, they fell right into the grace of God. You see, the person who falls from grace is the person who thinks that they stand on their own, who thinks that they can stand with God on their own, who thinks that they can, by, by their faith, or who thinks that by their behavior, or thinks through by their performance of whatever kind it is that God accepts them because of their works, that person has fallen from grace. It's not sin that makes you fall from grace. It's self-righteousness that makes you fall from grace. That's what the scripture says. It's self-righteousness, thinking you can do it on your own. You see, the effect of Christ's death to justify us and to make us right with God is nullified when we place ourselves under the law. Circumcision at that time was the first step to placing oneself under the law, meaning you are now trusting in your own works. That's what, when, when a person was going to become a, a Jew, every a Jewish person that was born, every male person that was born, on the eighth day they were circumcised. And the Bible says that if they were not circumcised, they were to be cut off from among the people. So circumcision for them was not an option. It was a requirement. It was a requirement. It was the cut of the covenant, as it were. For a New Testament believer who's supposed to just trust in Jesus, for us to decide, well, I'm going to uh, 
or get circumcised in a sense, or I'm going to be begin to practice some things in the law. I'm going to begin to perform and expect God to respond to me that way. What you're saying is, is that I've done what I needed to do to be right with God myself. So he says here that you fell from grace when you did that. You fell from grace. Grace is a position of highest favor that is given to you as a gift. He put you up there. You didn't walk up there. You didn't yeah. jump up there. You didn't fly up there. He placed you up there. You're there because of Jesus and Jesus alone. To say, well, I'm up here. I can keep myself up here. It's to deceive yourself. It's to deceive yourself. You cannot keep yourself in a place of righteousness with God on your own. You can only achieve that. You can only experience that through Jesus Christ. You and I will never be good enough. No, no matter how much you try, you're never going to be good enough where you will be able to be acceptable to God except through Jesus Christ. In Christ alone, we must place our trust. In Christ alone, it's in Jesus. That is so important for us to realize as the church, there's really no more important topic than this. There's no more important thing that we need to know. We need to know that it's all about Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The Bible says when he was, the angel came and told uh, Mary, uh, or it was a Joseph, one of the two, what his name was going to be. He said, you, for you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. He saved us from our sin. He's our savior. We have to realize that it's all about him and not about us. Now, it's really interesting. Uh, the people who were saved, the Gentiles who were saved, you know, when the gospel went to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles who were saved, did you realize that those people were idolaters? Things that were spoken of in the Old Testament that God strictly commanded Israel not to do, those people were doing it. Yeah. And when they got saved, they didn't have to promise not to do that anymore to get saved. They didn't have to sign a contract not to, not to follow idolatry anymore but to get saved. All they had to do was hear the gospel and believe, and God made them right with himself because they believed. We, we, we have to really think about that because... In our minds, we categorize sin. I know I do. Uh -huh. yeah. We categorize sin. Some stuff folk do, uh, have, have, are doing, well, I don't do it, but that stuff's really bad. <laughs> Ooh, man, they, that's some bad stuff they're doing. I can't understand how God won't have anything. Those people got to change first. They got to live right first. God can't, they can't be accepted by God with them just having freshly done that. No, they got to live right for about a year and a half. And then they can get saved. Well, I'm sorry, but the word of God doesn't say that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means whosoever. Doesn't matter what they've done. Doesn't matter where they've been. Doesn't matter what they've been into. If they will call on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Now, that doesn't mean after they get saved that the Spirit of God is not going to direct them to cease from some, some of those activities. Yeah. But they don't have to straighten up first. Amen. But we think they do. But I got news for you. You don't know how bad you were. You really don't. You really don't really think about how bad you were. We, you know, we, we kind of sugarcoat uh, our sin. We put powdered sugar on it and spread some jelly on it and make it, it don't look so bad. You know, <laughs> people go get pictures uh, taken today. And even on my computer, you can do certain things. You can touch up that picture and make yourself look younger than you really are. Make yourself look better than you really, than you really look. And so we touch up our, our sin, our sin. We touch up our past. We don't want to think or nobody to think that we were as bad as we were, but I think we need a reality check. Yeah, yeah you were on the way to hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You deserved to go to hell. Your lifestyle was that bad to God. You say, well, I didn't do a whole lot of things, but you did something. Mm -hmm. All have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't make a difference if you miss it by an inch, or miss it by an inch, or if you miss it by a mile. If you missed it, you missed it. That was it. So Jesus came along and equalized everything. Everyone, no matter what they were doing, all they had to do was believe on Him. Thank you. 
the change that was going to take place in their life was going to be because the Spirit of God was going to come and live inside that sinner because they were now born again. They believed on Jesus and their life change was going to take place because the Spirit of God was in them working it out. See, the, the improvements that you've made in your life since you got saved, you didn't do that by yourself. No, you didn't. Amen. If left to yourself, you still do what you were doing before. But the Spirit of God lives inside of you, and He's been working with you and working on you, and He's been very patient with you. But it's all about grace. So it's grace for them out there who are not saved yet, and it's grace for us who are saved. It's all about grace. Amen? Amen. You know, Romans chapter 4. Uh, verse 4 says, that, 4, 4 and 5 says this, Not to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, the person who performs, the reward that they would receive is not of grace, it's of debt. In other words, you, when you, you, you're going to work again tomorrow, most of you, and uh, you went to work Friday, last week. The money that they're going to pay you for the hours or time spent there, was it a gift? Uh-oh. You earned that. It was a debt. <laughs> Getting up that early in the morning, traveling to that place with those people, doing, doing that stuff. That wasn't something you wanted to do, something you had to do. Yeah. It's not grace. It's works. But he says, but to him that works not, who doesn't perform, but believes on him who justified the ungodly, his faith is counted in him for righteousness. Who does God justify? The ungodly. Everybody say that. God justifies, God justifies. the ungodly. Yeah. So if you are, are justified, guess what? You are ungodly. Mm -hmm. Oh, Pastor Anthony, I wasn't ungodly. I wasn't that bad. You were ungodly. Or else he couldn't have justified you because he only justifies the ungodly. He does not justify the godly. They don't need it. Mm -hmm. Only the ungodly need justification. If all of us were justified by faith, as the scripture tells us in Romans chapter 5, uh, then if we're justified, then that means we were ungodly. We are saved by his grace, not by our works or performance. You got saved by his grace initially, you remain saved by his grace now. It's, that's what we need to understand. Okay, let's look at Romans uh, chapter 10, uh, begin with verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He said, Brethren, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God on behalf of my countrymen is for their salvation. For I bear witness that they possess an enthusiasm for God, but it is un unenlightened enthusiasm. Ignorant of the righteousness which God provides and building their hopes upon a righteousness of their own, they have refused submission to God's righteousness. For as, mean, for as a means of righteousness, Christ is the termination of law to every believer. So Paul's writing here about, you know, the Israel, his people, that they were ignorant of the righteousness which God provides. God provides. Under the old covenant, God required righteousness. Under the new covenant, God provides righteousness. There's a difference. Required righteousness, you have to provide yourself. Provided righteousness, you just receive as a gift. We have provided righteousness. It has nothing to do with how well you've been doing. It has nothing to do with your behavior, conduct, or performance. At all. You are righteous by faith in Jesus Christ and by faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's how you're right with God. This is true, really. Uh, if you don't believe the grace of God, and you, you can say, be said that you have an enthusiasm for God. You're zealous of God, a zeal for God, but it's not based upon the proper knowledge. This false enthusiasm will leave you a person ignorant of the righteousness which God provides while they're still seeking a righteousness which they can perform. And I, I keep emphasizing this, and the scripture keeps emphasizing this, because of how easily we will slip back into performance. Mm -hmm. 
you'll slip back into performance, slip back into thinking that God feels about you the way you feel about yourself. God feels about you the way other people feel about you. God feels about you, uh, he's angry with you, he's bitter with you, he's upset with you, he's displeased with you, he's dissatisfied with you. There's always going to be something that Satan is going to throw at you to try to make you think that God's opinion of you is based upon what you've been doing or what you've done. It's not. God's opinion of you has been fully satisfied through Jesus Christ our Lord in, in, um, it's in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse, uh, no it's Ephesians chapter 1 rather. It says we've been made accepted in the beloved. You're accepted by God in the beloved. Jesus is God's beloved son. Your acceptance is in him. It's rest in him. So as long as Jesus is acceptable to God, I'm acceptable to God. You're acceptable to God. We need to be firmly established on the word of his grace. We need to be firmly established on that so that then we can live our lives and approach God and the things of God with confidence, not questioning or wondering whether God's going to answer your prayer this time because I haven't prayed as much as I should pray. I haven't read the Bible as much as I should read the Bible. I haven't done a whole host of other things that I know are good things that I should do, but I haven't done them to the degree that I need to. God, will you accept me now? God, am I okay with you now? God, are you satisfied with me? God, God I messed up again. I know you're disappointed in me. I know I've let you down. I know I've not done everything the way you want me to do. But you're trusting in yourself. You know, you're like a person. You're out to dinner with somebody. And they decide, uh, I'll pick up the check. I got this. And you, you say, well, no. I want to pay my share. I want to pay my share. You know what I've learned? If I'm out to dinner with you, and you say, I pick up the check. I say, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then continue with the conversation. I'm going to bring it up again. I'm not going to say, are you sure? <laughs> now, there was a time I would do that. Are you sure? I, I don't want to be a burden to you. Now, uh-uh. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and pick it up. Praise the Lord. So, or I might say, well, I'll get you next time. Right. <laughs> You know, and, and that's be, learning to be humble enough to receive the grace of God. You learn to be humble enough to receive. See, you have to realize that person wanted to pick up that check. You know what that was? That was the grace of God. He put it on their mind and their heart to do that for you. For you to refuse it or say no or to try to pay it yourself is that that's the way you are with God. You think you got to pay for everything. And so it's hard for you to receive a gift. You got to be willing to accept a gift, a free gift. You got to be willing to accept it. Just be appreciative and receive the gift. There's no more works that you have to do. No more performance that you have to do. God likes you just like you are. You know, he likes you too much to leave you that way, but he likes you just like as you are. He's getting you heaven ready. He's getting you heaven ready. That's what he's doing. Not that you have to be made more righteous to be, to be in heaven, so that you'll be used to righteousness when you're in heaven. <laughs> just so you'll be used to it. That's what your living right does. It's just you becoming more connected condition to heaven than you are to earth. You're living in a manner that reflects heaven rather than earth because the Bible says you're citizens not of this world. Your citizenship is above. Yes. So God expects you to live that way, but he gives you the ability to live that way. Right. Again, not requiring it of you, but providing it to you. Who, I, this, 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 this song that I, I've got the lyrics to, I want to read them to you. Uh, it's going to be on the screen. My hope is built, you've heard this before, on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Then I, just, I like the second verse. It says, when darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. And then, and then the last verse of the song, I love it. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in righteousness alone, faultless. To stand before his throne, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of 
the ground is sinking sand. Is your hope resting in him? Are you solely trusting in him? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, say God who is rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. Rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. So much more I want to share with you about this. So much more to this. We've got to get this, folks. I want us to stand in this, and I want us to live in this. But let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercy. Oh, God, help us to remember. Help us to remember your mercy. That you, God, are rich in mercy. You are rich in mercy. You saved us by your grace. It is a gift we've received from you. Our standing with you never changes. Thank you, Lord. I pray that each one of us who hear this, Lord God, would receive it, would believe it, and would continue to live by it and to stand in it, to walk in it. I thank you for your mercy and your grace. Help us to understand that our prayers are answered not based upon what we've done, but based upon what Jesus has done for us. And we can receive anything from you because we are righteous by faith and we are accepted by you in your beloved son. I thank you and I praise you for it right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise this morning, folks. Amen.